welcome. Welcome back uh, to this uh, auditorium of the School of Industriales at Politecnica de Madrid. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to welcome you again. For those of you who not uh, been here yesterday, I am uh, Ruth Carrasco, the Associate Director of this school for the Sustainable Development Goals. And I will be serving as your Master of Ceremonies for today. Uh, yesterday, we were discussing in the scenes that in keynotes we have the beginning and next in four round tables, the technologies that are going to pave the roadmap to decarbonize our cities, our nations at the globe for 2050, for the mid-century. And today, we will keep this dis discussion, this conversation, talking about how to implement these technologies, which are the metrics we need, which are the implementation processes needed, which are the systems opportunity that are hidden, and when we look at the system as a whole picture, what can be uh, uh, done or what is uh, the synergies that can be found in that area. So uh, before starting, let me uh, remind some housekeeping arrangements, which is we have translation headsets available in the main uh, door if you need them. If you need a translation headset now, do not hesitate to ask our volunteers and they will be glad to, to bring it up for you. There is also Wi-Fi available, the password and the user is available there. And the hashtag that is going to be uh, used during the whole conference is systems transformation. I think it might be somewhere yeah, in the slide up there. So let me introduce the first uh, panel, the welcoming uh, panel, which is uh, made up by Alberto Garrido, who is the vice rector of uh, quali for quality and efficiency at UPM, Politecnica de Madrid. He is the responsible for the SDG strategy in the whole university, and he is also the coordinator of all the UPM activities that are uh, being arranged around the, the conference of the parties, COP. And uh, Lady Pajin, who is the chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network in Spain, SDSN Spain, and she's also the global development director of IS Global, which is the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. So the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to day two of the Low Emissions uh, Solutions Conference. Yesterday, we enjoyed a full day of relevant discussions and a wonderful dinner at the Casino de Madrid. I learned in just one day more about the challenge of reducing emissions than in weeks of study, at work, and reading. Remember, the transportation challenge, the shipping and aviation sectors, how complex problems appear when looking at trends and the numbers. Feeding the world is associated with 25 to 30 percent of world emissions, but the bio sector and soils conservation coupled with the expansion of forest land and soils conservation, holds promising of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions at a significant scale. But let's remind Professor Sachs' story about President Kennedy's mandate to bring a man to the moon and bring him back home safely. Nobody knew how to do it, and they did it. Scientists and engineers did it. Let me say how proud we at UPM are, are for hosting this conference and many other commitments and engagements we are having surrounding COP25. For us, COP25 began on November 28th on the occasion of the approval of UPM's Government Council of the interim goal of achieving zero net direct greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and in order to achieve climate neut neutrality by 2040. The COP for us continued with the Conference of the Young, 15, held at our Faculty of Sports and Physical Education on the 29th through December the 1st. As a higher education institution offering our university to 400 young people from more than 100 countries, helping them discuss their standpoints and presenting them in front of the General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, and the Spanish and Chilean Ministers of Environment. This has been a significant milestone for us. After COI-15, we boarded on a roller coaster of 12 events and dozens of participants, participations of UPM faculty 
both at the COP main venue and through our campuses. Just as reducing emissions requires assistance view, we believe all our disciplines are called for this innovation and urgent race. And this is what we wish to show during the COP. For those that will be around at the end of the week, please drop by UPM stand in the green zone from Wednesday to Friday this week. As our rector stated yesterday, UPM pledged a serious commitment and to this end, we've launched an ambitious program of decarbonization, pulling together all our strengths in engineering, architecture, and biosciences and technology to accelerate this transformation. But no institution can fight this battle alone. UPM is in Madrid. It is part of its essence and history, and we collaborate with the City Council of Madrid in its deep demonstration project. I'm not going to take more of your valuable time. I'd like to thank the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Sustainable Solutions Development Network, the Fundazione Enrico Mattei, and ICLEI Local Governments for, sustainable, for Sustainability, for holding this, this uh, Low Emission Solution Conference at the School of Industrial Engineering at the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. And finally, let me thank you all, people at UPM, for organizing this conference especially my colleagues, Professor Ruth Carrasco, Carlos Mataix, all the rest of the faculty, personnel, technicians from the school, and the rectorate, and volunteers, and also all our colleagues from Sustainable Solutions Development Network. I wish you the best of success on all the fruitful uh, discussions uh, on the day two of this conference. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Dear colleagues, Excellency Vice Rector, let me start by thanking Red's team. Red's, as you know very well, is the Spanish SDSN chapter. Thank you also to uh, ITD team. Carlos is, uh, and Alberto is always a big, big pleasure to work with your team. Thank you, Ruth, and the rest of the, of the colleagues of this uh, technical school and, and UPM. And of course, thank you to our volunteers. I think it's very exciting to see how our students and our young people have been involved in this COP25. And let me say, as a Spanish citizen, that it's, very, it's a pleasure and it's very exciting to see how, uh, how we've been involved and how, we, uh, how we've been able to organize this COP25 just in three uh, weeks. Well, for us, it's a pleasure to welcome to you to this second session. Yesterday, we have been a very interesting session, plenty of uh, interesting discussions and plenty of very concrete examples. As Professor Sachs said yesterday, uh, the neutral carbon challenge is a knowledge challenge. So we need uh, to know how to do it. We need uh, technology. We have a roadmap, but we need a strong political commitment and leadership. So today we have the opportunity to discuss again about which kind of solutions we will provide uh, uh, to the world for this goal. And we hope that the political nego negotiations that are just starting today in the COP25 conclude with important results and important agreements. Good morning to everyone. I have a good session and I have a good day. Thank you. OK, so let's move on on the first uh, panel today. Uh, the title of the panel is Defining Metrics and Zeroing Impact for Sustainable Development. And it's uh, a relevant panel that uh, we already discussed uh, yesterday about, well, we, we can have the, the technology, but how we are going to implement that and which are going to be the incentives and the market signals that make this, uh, this happen. So for this, uh, this panel, the moderator will be Perrine Toledano, who is the head of extractive industries at the Center on Sustainable Investment in Columbia University. And so while the chairs are being placed, I would like to invite Perrine coming to the stage 
together with the five uh, panelists of this uh, roundtable, who are Carlos Salle Alonso, Mark Luis, Susan Green, and Matthew Phillips. So please uh, accommodate yourselves. You have here if you want to. So I leave the floor to Perrine. Thank you so much, Ruth. Everyone, yeah. So the topic that we are prepared to discuss this morning, and I'm a little short for this, <laughs> is the fact that there is a proliferation of rating, benchmarking, reporting efforts to assess companies' alignments with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. However, there is no commonly accepted definition, standard, rating, or reporting methodology being used, and rigor and comprehensiveness is often missing. So this is what the panel will uh, focus on today, this problem, this lack of standardized sustainability metrics. We will, act, we will uh, highlight the extent to which it's a problem, to what extent it delays deeper action, to, well, to what extent it delays the identification of practicalities that we discussed yesterday, and to what extent it provides a free pass to companies that are promising more than they are prepared to deliver. So before I present our fantastic panelists this morning and give them the floor, I will say a few words on the initiative that we developed at Sorry, I forgot to present my center, and I will do it in a bit. So my center is uh, the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. We sit at Columbia University, sorry for this interruption. And uh, we partner closely with SDSN on many activities, and one of these uh, being the one that I'm presenting now. This is, uh, uh, for this initiative, we got the support um, from Iberdola. And this initiative emerged from the fact that a few companies came to us with the statement that despite the, prolifer the proliferation of sustainability frameworks and what is called ESG data, environmental, social, and governance data in the financial world, the financial place still doesn't reward effort um, that, truly, that truly align with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. So the question is, what is wrong? To answer this question, us, with SDSN, we analyzed, we analyzed the number of sustainability reporting and assessment initiatives. And to do this, we used a normative framework that I will present in a few seconds. So while doing so, we realized a few things. One is that a serious sustainability assessment cannot limit itself to headline headline reporting. For instance, is there, um, is, is there a carbon, carbon price, an internal carbon price that is being used? This sustainability assessment should enter the detail, meaning is this carbon price high enough? Is it above the minimum that is prescribed by the IPCC? Second, given the wide range of reporting methodology, a serious deep assessment is tedious time-consuming and clearly not undertaken by many sustainability assessments. In many cases, self-reporting is too vague to draw conclusions. Fourth, and very importantly, something that Jeffrey Sachs has been alluding to many times is that companies are rewarded for sustainability actions even when they do everything to delay serious progress. For instance, developing products that are contradictory to the achievement of the SDGs, investing in more fossil fuel infrastructure, investing in junk food, lobbying against ambitious regulations for climate change, for instance, or exploiting the loopholes of the international tax system, thereby undermining public finance. Fifth, finding. Too many sustainability assessment framework compare companies between themselves instead of comparing companies towards a, against a standard that is necessary to achieve the SDGs. And this is particularly not useful when the leader of the sector is a laggard comparatively 
to the standards that we need. These standards are so far loosely established or scattered across frameworks. So to address this issue, um, our partnership, CCSI SDSN, took a stab at developing such a framework. This is a conceptual framework that relies on four pillars, and it highlights that a comprehensive and holistic review of companies' alignment with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement cannot afford not to include the following four dimensions. The product that the company produces, the process of how this product is produced, the responsibility the company takes for its value chain, and whether the company is a good corporate citizen, which, in, which includes responsible participation in policy making and responsible tax principles. So our analysis will be published soon and open to wide uh, consultation and engagement strategies. On that note, I'm now delighted to turn to our panelists. The first of our panelists is Suzanne. Suzanne, you are the program manager at the S Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative of the MIT in the US. With colleagues, you developed the CO2 accounting framework built on the GHG protocol uh, tailored to the logistics sector. Together, we will do one for the mining sector. So I want to ask you, what are the critical problems that these initiatives aim to address and with what expectations? 